And as a reminder for the Q&A messaging, yes, write it down. But also you can do it in the Q&A session or in the chat box, which you can see on the screen. Just write down your questions, and then later on, we will answer these questions going forward. That's it for today for this introduction. So let me first introduce my esteemed colleagues. When we move to the next slide, of course. So we have first starting with nature conservation. We've got Dr. Gary Yates, and Gary will talk about different parts of our nature conservation part because he's the head of our fauna department, but also of Kadori Conservation China. And he will present as well work from our floral department as, um, as our ecological advisory program when appropriate. So after Gary has a big chunk of, uh, of the work we do, this is being followed by Josephine Wu, who is heading our holistic education department. And education is increasingly an important part of our work here because we like to educate and promote about all the different things, what is happening at Kadori Farm, and also what you can learn from it and participate in it. And all this nature conservation, this holistic education should ideally move towards sustainable living. And ID Wong is heading up our sustainable living uh, practice, which includes the green hub, it includes the food hub, but also more programs in general about how we can live more sustainably again in this fast changing world. Sustainability, what we call it, um, <laughs> elegant simplicity, but what ID will elaborate, elaborate on later. So all of these different uh, pieces of information, and you have, may have more questions, which you can answer in question in the audience uh, half an hour at the end. And I will then close, clo close the, uh, the webinar about 5.30, maybe a little bit earlier after the session. So thanks again for joining us. And let me quickly give you first an introduction to Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden. Many of you may have visited us and uh, with your children or when you were a child yourself, but we were established already in 1956. And since almost 70 years now, we've been changing ourselves to a changing world. And also we transformed ourselves into, I would say, a regenerative organization. What you see, the beautiful picture here, in all the pictures, what you will see during this presentation, are taken from our annual report, which is a, a highlight, which highlights our achievements over the past 15 months. So this is around the Brothers Pavilion, it's a beautiful moon gate, and it's one of the top uh, attractions in one of the most beautiful parts of Kadori Farm. Now, how it all started in the 50s and 60s, this is how Kadori Farm would look like. Barrel hillsides with terraces where we had uh, different crops, different uh, products, different trees. And it was basically, yes, the production site in 1956. And in those days, the Kadori Agriculture Aid Association was set up to help migrants from mainland China to basically help themselves, something what ID will present a bit later on as well. In the, in the 90s, when Hong Kong had changed and we changed with it, going from a more primary agricultural uh, society to a service in industrial society. So there was no need really to be being a production farm anymore. And we transformed into a, uh, to a forest but also we still have farming plots in there. This is a picture taken uh, from 15, 20 years ago. It's mostly a secondary forest, but you can still see the tea plantations the, and different uh, crop plantations in there. And the lower buildings, which you see bottom in the left, just above the 2000, that's where we sit at the moment in doing this webinar. So this is how we transformed from a farm to a nature reserve. At the same time, we also have the green hub in Taipo. And the Green Hub actually started as an oldest um, building on the new territories. It's an old police station. And then basically it was totally overgrown after the end of the, of the beginning of the, this millennium. And basically it was almost for, made for uh, demolition. But we transformed it uh, with government support into where we are now. It's the beautiful Green Hub. It's a hub for sustainable living. Again, ID will focus on that. But it shows how we transformed and also we regenerate stuff. And in that, we'd like to be an example for Hong Kong. We'd like to provide inspi inspiration to see how we can actually move from a stressful life. And of course, having lived in a few countries myself, Hong Kong is arguably one of the most busiest and to, for some of the most stressful parts of the world. And a lot of people actually have a pretty stressful life. And what we believe, it's great to having actually a more low carbon lifestyle. 
it's not just to do things less, but to do things differently, to live differently and predominantly to eat differently. So what you see here on the right hand side is a beautiful enchanted patio, the interior of the Green Hub. And we have similar beautiful places at Kadori Farm Botanic Garden too. Places where you can slow down in your lifestyle, maybe where can you relax, but also receive inspiration and regeneration for how your life could be, how a life could be for a lot of other people. So these are the three different spheres, as we call it, we'll call it the three pillars. Yeah, it's the nature conservation, holistic education, and sustainable living. As explained earlier, nature conservation is being delivered by the flora, fauna, and Kodori conservation departments, but also our regenerative agriculture departments. It's, it's now really an example how agriculture in Hong Kong could be practiced. Josephine will talk about holistic education, which we believe is definitely much not only information, but we're using the hand and the heart with the head as well, followed by, by ID with sustainable living. So those are the three main pillars of Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden. Now, for every presentation, it's good to throw in a few numbers to also see what we do as an organization, how many people we attract. Because the more people we speak to, the more people we invite, the more people we are able to inspire with our, our, our messaging, I think the more impact we have. Now, these are the last six years, but a lot of years in Hong Kong's recent, very recent history have been a bit atypical. Of course, we had three COVID years behind us. We had a year of a lot of protests and social movements. And actually, the only, or would say, the normal, call it normal between brackets years, were perhaps 2017, 18. And then now we are back in this year, in last year, back to gradually to normal after the COVID period. As you can see, we the, our visitor numbers went down for quite a few years, but last year we were back onto track. Now, to just for a technical reason, we have a, a, a 12 months, a 15 months uh, reporting because we try to align our different reporting periods. But last year we were still three months close due to COVID. So, the 165,000 of visitors, that's a, what we call it a normal year for Hong Kong. And as you can see here, we've got almost 20,000 kids from schools. We have commercial groups, which is most corporations doing uh, behind the scenes tours and paying uh, sponsorship for that. We have a lot of other NGOs. And then, of course, we've got individual walk ins. Again, many of you may have been here before, and please come again. Kadori Farm is a beautiful place, which is visit at least once a year or every once every season. In the summer, it's hot and humid, but beautiful. In the winter, it's cool and breeze. It's beautiful as well. So this is just a short introduction to Kadori Farm Botanic Garden, the overall big picture. And from here, I'm giving over to Gary, and then Gary will start talking more about the nature conservation part. So this is also a picture taken about uh, by the famous photographer, Robert Ferguson. It's in our annual report. You can see this beautiful picture taken here in the spring in Botanic Garden of the Cherry Blossoms. So I stop screen, stop the screen, and Gary, over to you. Okay. And meanwhile, while you're talking, I think, there you go, and I'll stop talking. Gary, over to you. Um, sorry, I have a slight problem. Okay, um, thank you, Wanda, and um, good afternoon, everyone, um, or those of you that are in um, Hong Kong. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the highlight, highlights under the three programs that sit under nature conservation. Um, our nature conservation work broadly aims to protect and preserve the rich biodiversity of the region and bring about ecological restoration. And we all hope that uh, what we accomplished through our work also contributes to nature's resilience and our preparedness as we all face the ongoing climate crisis. Um, I'm gonna start with the fauna conservation uh, work, some of the program work of this department. Um, it was established in 1994 because of um, uh, 
um, a need. Um, we saw gaps um, in local conservation um, work or areas that weren't being uh, well uh, studied. So that was why we developed the Fauna Conservation Program. And since, uh, since we developed it, as you can see, uh, we created a few roles which kind of um, sort of developed naturally over the, the, the few years after 1994. The Wild Animal Rescue Center was uh, a very clear need for Hong Kong. And so that was kind of an obvious thing with some of the um, experience that early members of the staff at Kuduri Farm had. Uh, so we established the, the center uh, in 1994. And you can see on the, the right, the, the, the photograph actually was taken inside the rescue center. And it looks very exciting with that big python, which is part of our stray snake program, which I, I may mention a little bit later. But actually, we, we end up dealing with um, several pythons this size every year. So we need quite a few people involved in the measurements and um, taking DNA samples. It's actually a project we do in partnership with AFCD. And uh, we're, we're doing some monitoring of the release of python through microchipping. Um, the Endangered Species Conservation Projects is um, another very important part of the work. And again, it involves um, a collaboration with AFCD. And I would say that the, the project that spearheads this um, area of our work is the, um, the work to save the iconic golden coin turtle from extinction. So it, in the early days, again, when we were looking for things where we could add value in Hong Kong, this turtle popped up as one that really needed help. And uh, we've been running a, a project, a breeding project um, um, for, for many years now uh, to try to assure that this species does not become um, extinct um, in the wild. Uh, next. So this is a, a shot inside the rescue center again. And um, it, it shows really the action that starts to happen after we receive a, a, sea, a confiscation of exotic turtles. So, um, or ex any exotic animal actually, but turtles normally uh, uh, come to us in quite large numbers. Um, apart from dealing with native species like the python and um, uh, the diversity of native animals, we've basically probably seen nearly every species coming to the rescue center um, of birds and mammals um, from, from Hong Kong. But we also deal with exotics, the, the animals that are part of the illegal wildlife trade. And staff can be seen here um, starting the triage where the, um, the turtles arrive and we check whether or not um, they're alive, um, sick or um, dead, um, healthy. Um, and then they get uh, passed off to different areas uh, to be cared for and rehabilitated. Um, this is a sort of condition that often the turtles are traded in um, where they, they would be uh, crushed together. And so one of the first things that we would do is to separate them out by species. So identification is quite a key um, early part of this um, action. And then, uh, of course, the treatments that they, they then require. And then, of course, placement. Um, once the, uh, so while we are holding these animals on behalf of the government um, while there are actions being taken to follow uh, the investigations and the legal cases by the authorities. And um, these are obviously live evidence as well uh, when, when they have been passed to Goodori Farm. But uh, we then help to find a long-term solution for these animals. So from the point of arrival, there's a, a long period of rehabilitation for many. And then you could see staff on the right-hand side preparing the uh, turtles to be um, shipped overseas. And in this particular case, the turtles were off to, um, to Austria and Italy. Um, it's unfortunate that repatriation doesn't happen too often because 
uh, clearly it would be better to send, or we think it would be better to send some of these species back to the country of origin, but um, because of the uh, the trade routes um, and the, uh, um, the, 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 the disease um, control issues, um, often animals aren't able to go back to the, the country of origin, even if we knew where that was. So they get packed and following um, uh, regulations like the IATA for the shipment of animals, we have to pack the animals up carefully and humanely uh, for them to get to uh, their destination. So they arrive here definitely not in a humane way, and we hope to get them off um, safe to their, their final destination. And apart from um, this, this, these actions, which involve the rescue of animals and uh, dealing with uh, seized um, uh, species, um, the Rescue Centre also carries out um, capacity building and training uh, because it's, it's quite unique. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of different species of wild animals. Um, and not only are we learning almost every day uh, from the, about the different species we get, but we can then share uh, this with other people. And in this particular picture, uh, field researchers um, are, are getting some uh, um, advice from our senior vet about humane methods of DNA collection from wild turtles, wild native turtles. So how to uh, take samples in a very um, animal friendly and humane uh, way. And the, the attendees at this particular um, a workshop included uh, AFCD, Lingnan University, and our own KFBG staff. And this, this uh, picture represents um, a milestone for the, the rescue centre because um, we, we are now over 68,000 animals we've received since we um, established the centre in 1994. Um, and this was the 60,000th animal that arrived. So it was a, um, a young palaces squirrel. Um, apart from the fact that it was a special milestone, you can see how, how uh, much care actually has to go into even just one single young animal that requires like, like surrogate feeding and maybe is fed every hour or every couple of hours. If you multiply apply that up by 100 birds and maybe five other squirrels plus, um, you can see how busy the staff are, particularly during periods when um, there are lots of young animals around. And you know, one of the best parts of the job, uh, not just for me, but for my frontline staff, uh, when we get to release animals, and again, this can be quite important because uh, in the picture you can see a brown wood owl. And um, I think 20 years ago, as far as I know, this, this owl was not resident in Hong Kong. So it's actually a species which has expanded its range from its range in Guangdong province into Hong Kong. Um, I think that's a really uh, interesting point because Often in conservation, you're talking about losses all of all the times, and it's it's quite a fairly negative uh, figures and statistics you often hear. But it's really nice to know that birds are expanding their range into Hong Kong, and that's partly due to the um, the forest and the maturation of our secondary forests um, and the conservation of the country parks, the protection of the country park um, areas, and that in Hong Kong. So. It's really made a difference, and these wild animals are showing us that. And then um, another interesting technique which was used quite recently when we had um, a, a young bat, a young dog-faced fruit bat. Um, I learned from an, an Israeli uh, sanctuary for bats that sometimes what they do is while they're rehabilitating young bats, they'll try to take them back to the, the site where they were rescued and see if the, if the mother is still alive and if she would collect the young bat. That will save us a lot of time, of course, because then we don't need to surrogate the bat. And in this case, one of my staff here um, showed it was actually successful. So what you're seeing there, although the picture is not very clear, 
is a mother bat that's flown in after she heard the young bat calling in a park in Hong Kong. And she's collecting the baby from my staff and then flying away with that. So um, it's quite a nice little technique which, which was successful uh, quite recently. And some statistics about um, our, uh, some figures of the rescue uh, center. So since 1994, um, this, these figures are up to March um, already, we're way over the 65,000, but it gives you an impression of how many um, animals that uh, we receive are actually released and rehomed. And you can see quite quickly that obviously there's um, uh, 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 around 50% of the animals actually don't make it. Um, that's very sad, and it sounds like a very large number, or well, it is a large number, but when you consider that many of the animals that arrive are already sick and injured, um, in fact, any wild animal that can be captured and picked up and brought to the rescue centre, it must be in a fairly weak way, because otherwise the animal wouldn't have been captured in the first place. And uh, the 50% figure is actually quite uh, a good figure compared to other rescue centers around the world um, that have to deal with uh, wild animals. And then we also have some figures which relate to um, the annual turnover of um, animals, which again is um, very high. So um, we have over 4,000 animals a year and um, amongst those, we, we get about 2,000 birds. Um, only 10 years ago, uh, the figure that I was seeing for our, um, the, the, our annual uh, bird numbers was um, about uh, 400. So it's really, really gone up quite a lot. And um, this, this, I've added these pictures to sort of look a bit towards the, the future because our rescue center is getting quite old now. We've been around for a while, 28 years. Um, one of those pictures at the top there shows the, the center actually being built, our sanctuary cages. And you can see, even when we built the rescue center, it was built on top of the old pigsties, which dated back to the days that Wanda mentioned in the 1950s, uh, when the farm was doing charitable work and breeding uh, chickens and pigs. Um, and then from that point, our centers kind of uh, developed um, in an organic way. And um, if we could start again with a clean slate, we would do things quite a bit differently because we're now very concerned about issues uh, like um, biosecurity, which um, when you where we have to really control disease and disease spread and make sure that in our own work that we're not putting animals close to other animals uh, that were healthy that could get captured a disease or a virus or whatever so there are there are many things that we could do to improve facilities and um, we hope you can see all of the facilities are, are quite old we hope that um, we can find funding uh, in the future to um, to redevelop the rescue center and um, um, create some of the biosecurity measures which are not very um, stringent um, at the moment. Um, this, this is an interesting project, the Community Bat uh, Project, which um, we, we again, it, it's a link with the AFCD. We've done quite a lot of cons conservation partnership with AFCD over the years. And this started off as a conflict in a village um, in Lam Chun, where AFCD in invited uh, some of my staff to join them to, to try to talk uh, the villagers into not getting rid of bats that were living in an old ancestral building. Um, and uh, it was a very hot meeting on the first day, but we managed to find a compromise with the villagers. And as long as we collected the guano, and took it away every month, they were happy to leave the bats alone. And the bat is the Himalayan um, leaf nose bat, which is our largest insect eating bat in Hong Kong. It's a very important species e ecologically. And um, since the early days in 2005, when we started this, every month we've been removing the guano, uh, taking it to Kaduri Farm, 
and our uh, regenerative agriculture department has been compost composting it and then it's been moving to our shop to be sold so um and uh, last year we we had 279 kilograms of back guano mixed with the sawdust which um, is used as a high sort of grade potting soil um, and sells uh, reasonably well from our um, our shop at Gurry Farm. So this this is sort of a I've added this really because it, it is a kind of a win win solution that can be found if you are patient and if you work with um, the local community. Um, we would like to be we'd be more comfortable if we knew this was a really sustainable project, but it relies at the moment on the older generation in the village. So um, we're hoping that um, it will carry on uh, with the younger generation in future. Um, another important role that uh, we play is providing advice um, uh, related to um, um, ecological enhancement and dealing with things like bird strike on windows. How do we stop birds hitting windows? There's an emerald dove here. I think this picture was sent to us by the MTR. Uh, they wanted to find a solution to the window strikes. Um, and uh, there are a number of different solutions, but one of the ones we use at the farm is this dotted uh, uh, film that's placed on the window, which you can see on the right-hand side, which uh, birds can see and prevents um, them striking. And it's not to, uh, it doesn't uh, prevent the light from coming through the window and things like that. So, and then the other pictures that on the bottom left, uh, we've been working with the WSD and other government departments to find ways of allowing animals to get out of catchments. Um, the, the, the catchment sides are too steep, they can't get out. Um, and so we've been coming up with uh, solutions uh, like um, uh, ways for them, steps and that for them to, to get out of these um, catchments. So this is our ecological enhancement work. It's certainly developing because the more construction and development that occurs in Hong Kong, the more interest we get from uh, companies wanting to, to do things right and in a more animal friendly manner. Okay, on to um, flora. So um, a key strategy for the flora conservation work is to protect the existing secondary forests and to build the diverse composition of woodland plants through restoration work. So really moving towards how the ancient forests used to be, the composition used to be much more diverse, um, uh, many more different species. And of course, those uh, different species of plants and trees supported a much higher biodiversity of, uh, of the fauna as well. We would have had flying squirrels and uh, hornbills in Hong Kong in the past when we had very big uh, trees, uh, big forests. So the work of the fl floor department is to really try to bring this back. Um, much of the existing forest in Hong Kong consists of small um, uh, small uh, areas of, of less diverse um, species. And um, again, I mentioned about uh, trying to make the, 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 the countryside uh, more resilient for climate change and that. Well, uh, this work is very important in that sense as well to, to encourage uh, the, the restoration of the, the, the species in Hong Kong. Um, another area of work um, that the, the floor department are doing is, is collecting seeds from around the territory. So they have a permit to collect seeds of rare trees and shrubs and propagate those seeds so that they then become part of this, uh, of the components of this rich, diverse forest which they're, they're building. Um, and in this picture, um, there's a seed the, or the flower, I should say, of the glossy leaf star anise, which I believe is only there's only ten trees in Hong Kong uh, that exist in the wild. So it's clearly a very important species um, to propagate and to be part of this uh, reforestation of the hillside. And the floor department also manage our conservation genetics lab. And they've been doing wonderful things there, uh, making lots of 
new discoveries, um, been helping with identification of um, 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 items from the TCM trade, looking at animal sex confirmation, even for our own animals at Kaduri Farm, some of the, the species that come in through rescue uh, exotic species, which we need to ID. Um, also looking at otter fecal ID to check that uh, the species of otters in Hong Kong and um, whether they're related, that sort of thing. Sharks fin work, pangolin ID, pangolin scale ID and origin. And also you may have heard recently that um, our lab um, was behind the identification of a new species of pangolin, which was a, a really quite a, a big um, breakthrough through their work. Okay, moving from uh, Flora to um, KCC, the Kadori Conservation China. Um, our, our, our KCC team uh, generally should be on the mainland doing work, but over the last uh, couple of years, because of COVID restrictions and limited travel on the mainland, they have been doing more work in Hong Kong and helping us with some of our fauna programs as well through the Fauna Conservation Department. So they've got a good team of good field uh, researchers, biologists and ecologists, and um, they are doing work um, in the, um, the, the Greater Bay Area. Um, you can see here the work on the otter, which I mentioned already, and also um, some work on the um, farmland, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the birds, birds that are utilizing farmland areas and to find out how important farmland is to bird species, uh, the fish ponds and everything. Um, there's a picture of a Hong Kong otter. This program is still going on. The, the, the population seems to be very small, but it's a very important species to learn more about and so, that's one of the things that the KCC are still doing. And they are still working in, uh, in, um, in, on the mainland. And um, here there's a picture of a, a cowfit gibbon. Uh, there are only 150 of these left in the wild. So um, they're busy uh, working with the reserve staff, doing capacity building, basically trying to help to pr pr provide a situation where they can uh, capacity build, do some um, sharing, and then walk away and work on another area that really needs um, um, their, um, their team help. And this is a, 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 breed, a picture that's related to the breeding survey um, of a nature reserve in Hainan, and these are a couple of honey buzzards in a nest um, in Hainan. And again, very quickly, the, the, the farmland work that they've been doing has been very useful. It was kind of useful that they were stuck in Hong Kong, the team, because they did a great job doing the bird survey of the uh, of nine farmland sites. Uh, they they uh, recorded 154 bird species and 66 of those were considered of conservation concern. So um, that was very good work and um, they're still working on, on this project at the moment and sharing the results of this uh, work um, with others as well, include, including children, uh, um, teaching the importance of farmlands and wetlands in Hong Kong. Okay, um, that's the, the end of my introduction to the, uh, the fauna, uh, the, sorry, the fauna conservation and the nature conservation uh, goal uh, at Kadori Farm. Um, I'm going to pass over to Josephine Wu now, who's going to uh, take you through the holistic education uh, program work. So I'll just stop share, sharing here. Okay. Thank you, Gary. So let me try. Can you see?
Okay. So, uh, yeah, let me just. Uh, uh, thank you, Gary. Um, actually, it's a very informative um, session. Uh, I'm actually very um, privileged to work at uh, the Kajuri Farm. And especially just now, it's uh, a lot of information. And from the holistic education side, we really think that um, we should not learn just inside the classroom. So it's a lot of uh, ways that we can learn. And that's exactly where we are actually with the um, the holistic education. I actually lost my screen, I'm sorry. There's some technical problem here. Yeah, can you help me? I don't know why there is a, I cannot find the screen. Can you share again? This one yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe stop sharing. Share. I share again. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I did. But it didn't came up in my screen. Okay. Oh, there so there, there you go. Sorry, sorry. So I just maybe start again. Um, so um, what we do here at the farm for the holistic education, we really actually uh, hope that uh, we don't restrict ourselves to just um, learn it with our head. So if you look at this picture right here, sometimes I would imagine whether the rock would talk to us and whether the water will also give us some information about where we are and also why you know they're here. And when we are talking about holistic education, we also wish that um, the learners can also open up their hearts and also do more work with their hands. And on top of that, at the farm, we really hope that there is this oneness and also the idea of not just to learn different disciplines. We also want to interconnect all the disciplines. Say, for example, when we talk about ecology, we really hope that it integrates with the economy. And also when we talk about philosophy, we also hope that it's also practical. And more so just now uh, with Gary's uh, sharing, there is a lot about the science and also about nature conservation work. We hope that by doing so, we also learn to listen to the nature and so we build our ways of learning through the different intuitive powers and we gain back our true nature. So at the farm, we are really hoping that uh, at some point, um, all of us can actually think of rewilding our true nature. And that's why we also work on different kinds of programs. And one very important programs right now is on the Kaduri Earth program that we are working on. And this is a relatively new program, um, despite the fact we have already been um, working on it for a while. But it's a process we hope that we can actually uh, connect or integrate what uh, the farm's best um, resources and assets. Say the work that uh, Gary has just shared, and also some of the programs or all of the programs that ID will share later. And it's the um, uh, holistic education side. We really hope that we can integrate all these and to bring experiences that is life transforming. And I will talk a little bit more about that and also how to create the inner resilience and also the social resilience in the face of climate change and also the economic uncertainty right now. And especially during the COVID, we have received a lot of uh, inquiries or feedback from teachers that um, due to the social distancing and also uh, children are not, you know, developing as usual because they have been wearing their masks for a long time. 
So all these actually bring us to think that it's more in, imminent for educators to work together with the community. And as we are talking about all these, we cannot use the old ways to solve the problems. So this is what the gist of KEP is. And last year, actually, we have, uh, uh, due to the COVID, we work a lot on the online talk. Um, we invite international ecological speakers. Uh, for example, Satish Kumar. So um, he has um, inspired the farm a lot. And then he will be coming back uh, again this year. Uh, and also last year's talk, we um, also invited uh, Jane Goodo, who talks about nature conservation. And as Gary has mentioned, a lot of work that has been done at the farm. I hope that we also has the hope, just like uh, Jane has shared with us. And also on the um, uh, deep ecology part, Stefan is also uh, bringing us uh, online classes and also a lot of a new uh, understanding of the Gaia's. And also we have um, Kate Wellworth who talks about the donut economy. And also Rob who brings uh, the experience of building the transition towns and also Claire who actually help us to connect better with nature and also to show us how to use those energy in healing. And last but not least is John who actually share with us on the indigenous wisdom and also how to actually connect in a more raw or rudimentary way. So these actually help us to unfold what the KEP is about. It's a wide spectrum. And it's also a process that we also want to connect with the community to work together. So it's not just KEP, it's not just Kaduri Farm's duty or Kaduri Farm's uh, visions. We want to extend it to the general public. Another activities that uh, we have been doing quite a lot is uh, we can actually talk about more like a well-being. But again, this is not just uh, for the well-being sake. It's more for the inner resilience building. We bring um, the participants or the visitors uh, different kinds of programs, say walking in the forest to appreciate the forest in a really, really grounded manner. And also we have brought forward the sand art through photography and also guided meditation. And that's by Chaning Fa Si. And also we have invited um, yoga specialists and also a mindfulness teacher to run different kinds of programs. Some of them are residential while others are not. And this is a very good example that actually we worked with uh, children. And in particular, this group of children is those who have special education needs. So they benefit a lot from uh, being in nature and also accompanied by their parents. So one sharing that I got from uh, the parents is that uh, the, ch the child, the particular child is uh, not um, very good at hearing and also um, articulating. Uh, so after a few days of experience, so this particular girl, actually, when uh, they were talking at home after the activities, the girl didn't really want to stop because it's her experience with the parents coming together to the farm. So they enjoyed it. And also it becomes part of their memory. And also the girl was very, very articulate about all her experience. So it took um, the mother quite a surprise how much uh, her girl can actually talk instead of uh, normally, she wouldn't really actually relay any of her um, sharings or feelings. And this, uh, we hope to continue this kind of work. And also to work with children is also one of the main thing that uh, the Kaduri farm would spend resources on. This is just some of the activities that you can see, but we run winter camps, uh, summer camps, and also during um, normal like weekends, we run different kinds of visitors programs. So children can really have a feel of not just uh, you know in a concrete jungle, but 
uh, have hands on their soil and also maybe touching the um the the inner the inner feeling on animals through expressive arts as well. This is another key program that we have been uh, very very um, proud of because we worked with a lot of like dirt and dust and also maybe dead wood that we collected from um, the farm either due to um, the tree's age and also maybe damage from the inclement weather. So you can see that uh, children and also sometimes the adults are involved in doing some of these uh, work so that they can actually um, take it back home. And this is an important thing um, that we hope the farm is bringing you know, back to the community by using their hands a lot more. So it's not just on this sort of handicrafts. We also hope that people, you know, the, the participants or the children can enjoy the fun of creating things on their own and also with their own creativity. This is the center program that we worked with uh, uh, schools and also we bring them out to um, the school communities. And I think during the COVID, we are doing a lot more uh, and also on a hybrid mode. Sometimes we do uh, online talk, but we also bring it out to the communities a lot. So um, there are different uh, kinds of programs that we offer, but we always uh, include a, um, uh, the elements of using the hands as well. And this is another area that uh, we work together with, uh, say, Gary's team. So on animal uh, encounters, so we try to give a chance for the general public or for the visitors to really understand how the keepers are working with the animals and also the educators with, through these animal ambassadors to talk more about how we should do uh, in terms of uh, our own behavior to help the environment and also to coexist with all these other beings, so-called. And uh, we got a lot of help from volunteers as well. And also each year, the intern students from different universities also come to help us to organize some of the camps and the, the activities. This we are very grateful of. And this is another area that we have been developing and also uh, trying to work out more is to allow um, the children to go in, to work with the soil, to learn about sustainable living through making their own food and also through planting and also trying to actually understand more about where the source are and also how important the food is uh, from the local rather than actually going to the supermarket to get the food um, and also you know just uh, take it for granted that uh, we will have a, a good supply of uh, produce so we are trying to actually get all these in uh, through our programs and also food farm this is the last slide i have um is uh, satish uh, online uh, hybrid talk sorry so uh, on October 24th this is the one program that we still have some seats open and we hope that uh, uh, any one of you who have the time please join us in person uh, and if not it's also available online and also we will be actually posting them out uh, later on uh, on our YouTube channel. So uh, it's very, very um, inspiring to see Satish in person. And I really encourage you to spare the time to do so and join us. So this is my last um, slide. I'll stop here and I'll pass on to Ivy. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, even though I, I work with um, Gary and Joe on a daily basis and also see the program in person. But um, every time when I hear um, the report like this, I still find it so fascinating. So um, yeah, so here now is uh, my turn um, to um, share with you about the sustainable loving program um, and also the regenerative uh, program of the farm. And I will highlight what we have done last year and also um, give you an idea about what we are going to focus on in the coming uh, year. So um, Kaduri Farm um, is such a 
collective memory to Hong Kong people. And um, it was set up in the 1956, um, back in the day, um, by the Kadiri brothers as an experimental farm working on agricultural aid. And at that time, um, the mission is helping people help themselves. So um, in this photograph, you actually can see um, the color photo was taken more recently, but it's talking about 1969. Um, that shows that um, the farm's work actually go beyond um, the boundary of Hong Kong. It actually um, benefits people in the region like Lepo. And the back and right photograph actually so uh, back in the old days, um, the, at the time when the site of the Kaduri farm is under land formation to start the agricultural work. So um, today the farm has um, modified or um, also evolved in a way to cope with the changing need of the population. But still up to today, farming is still such a very important component of um, our program. And over the years, um, Kaduri farm, um, the way how we farm has changed a lot. And for example, we start um, organic farming since 1993. And since then, we have actually undergone a very transformative process to um, change the way of how we operate. For example, talking about the chicken. In the old days, we keep our mainly four types of chicken. Today, we still keep four types of chicken, but in a different way. For example, we are much more conscious on the water, the animal welfare, and the so-called waste, how we can manage it better. So for example, the chicken today, um, we are using a deep litter batting system to trap all the manure so that we save the water um, for sort of like draining the waste um, as a pollutant. But instead of pollutant, we recover them as nutrient to um, use as composting and also um, actually maintain the resilience of the site. So here in this slide, you show a few um, um, pictures showing how we operate the farm today, like um, on the um, uh, left top side, you see um, actually is our food forest. We are now farming like a forest and in brief, it's like in a more natural way. And we are also um, sort of like um, taking care of the soil in a way that that's why we reframe our program as regenerative agriculture since this year, which is focused on how we can maintain and also restore the productivity or the vitality of the soil in order to sustain um, the food production in the long term, but also other being which is relying on the soil to live together. So it is um so starting from this year, we are reframing our program um, under the name of regenerative agriculture. So the farm today is a perfect site um, for us to not just uh, showcasing better way or um, a kind of regenerative agricultural approach, which is must, much needed um, today in talking about like um, climate change challenge and other social issue. But it is also a perfect ground for us to um, focus on capacity building. So every year we have now running different range, different kind of uh, reskilling program, helping people to reconnect with the soil. So such program include like um, city farming program, which is focusing on more like an entry for people to learn about how to grow some of their own food or a more um, systematic training for people who are more serious on setting up their farmland. We also have very specialized program like um, apiary beekeeping um, training, and it is more than just talking about like keeping uh, bee for honey production, but we are very specialized on working with native bee in a way that it is um, harmonizing our relationship with the way how we are doing beekeeping with the bee, but also keeping this wildlife um, we are using, uh, we're working with native bee um, to serve the, the environment as what the natural um, organism will do in an ecological way. So um, most of the people who are joining the program are not just uh, people looking into um, developing their skill for honey production, but more in harmonizing, improving the environment. And also um, we are increasingly working in partnership with different organizations. For example, we are working with partners like um, 
the Academy for Sustainable Community of University of Hong Kong, and also um, with community organization like the Society for Community Organization. So this is um, like to the collaboration, we um, work with them to, to work with their target audience to use farming as a way um, sort of like um, helping to bring farming to the scenes of city farming, but also using farming as a approach to build a community. And also, um, for example, like in, in enhancing the dignity of the people and also the sense of community in such a way. Um, so food is always um, the subject of our, our work. And now I would like to move forward to um, another community project, which food is a very important component. We will also um, showcase um, some, a wider picture on sustainable loving. So this is a project that uh, Wanda mentioned earlier, which is a heritage revitalization project that we work in collaboration with the, uh, with the Hong Kong government to restore a historic compound, which is the old type of police station to a hub for the community to come together um, to learn and also to collaborate for sustainable living. So this project um, is special in the way that the heritage building is important in the historic sense, but we are also seeing that the site have many beautiful things like um, it is actually surrounded by trees. It actually got um, a very important, actually one of the most important Negro building sites next to it. Um, it has a lot of potential to be restored with um, habitat enhancement, and also it is very close to the community. So by making adaptive use of this campaign, we are actually preserving not just um, the historic building, but also actually the whole area, how the building interact with the surrounding environment. And it is actually commented by the UNESCO as a special project of um, preserving a green oasis as a whole. So this is something that we worked on in the past eight years, improving the site um, in order to have it to serve as a community hub for sustainable living. So for this um, green hub, food is um, still um, the most, one of the most important component for us to talk about sustainable living. Like every Hong Kong people, and I think most people in the world, when we want to have people come together, we say, let's have a meal, let's drink tea, let's have food together. So we actually see food as such a very um, special um, vehicle for us to bring people together and also, um, so sort of like soften um, their day-to-day -day worry, but also um, as a like um, um, a platform for people to interact. And food food actually, um, we can also um, talk about a lot of way of how to uh, harmonize our relationship in different sense. So for example, um, at the Green Hub, we have a program for the students to see how food from the field to the table. But more than that, we also see how our food waste can be returned to the soil as a kind of recover and sort of um, supporting our, our farmland. And also the Green Hub um, have different type of program like um, we have um, different workshops for people to um, sort of like using cookery, um, cooking together, gardening workshops, and also um, um, interacting with the police producer in a way of inquiring our relationship with food in a different way. So that is um, what we see important of rebuilding the relationship with um, the environment and also rebuilding the relationship with self. And we believe that if people are um, starting from food, they can make such a big difference. Um, so the, in the year onward, um, for the Green Hub, we are now moving to the second phase of um, serving more importantly as a hub because um, we also see that for people who would like to bring about positive change, it is very important to have a platform for us to come together, to share ideas, to learn from each other, and also working together. So um, in the recent year, the Green Hub is serving more like a hub for um, the sustainable producer to come here to interact with the um, consumer or their partner directly um, so that they can actually develop um, collaboration. It is also a hub for people to cultivate ideas like um, 
for, for, for animal wildlife conservation, for improving um, our community facility, like improving the interpretation for people who have special needs, um, for people to come together, like if we want to um, have carbon neutrality. So what is the way forward? So this is a increasingly serving as an important hub for these things to come together, these ideas to come together to bring to another level. And more importantly, I would also like to see that um, we, should, uh, we see the Green Hub as a place for cultivating a community. Um, we actually every year have lots of volunteers coming. Um, they perhaps are our participants who come across our program um, as an entry to come into this interaction. But later on, they want to do more. So um, the volunteer program and all those, also the continuous training becomes such an important uh, vehicle for us to gather this community together more so that um, we can sort of like uh, bring forward um, more initiative. So um, to recap, um, actually we, we see the Green Hub is working in our, in our system more like um, it is a hub to cultivate positive change and it is serving to connect people with people, with nature and also with action. And it is also um, a loving demo um, to inspire people for community cohesion and collaboration. And to move forward um, in the next, in, actually we are working on it now and we are going to move forward um, more in the coming year is um, when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, we are also talking about regenerative culture, how people interact with each other and how we interact with our environment and other being. And we believe it is so important for us to bring help people to help themselves this mission to help with our day world. So talking about food, um, what does food mean to us? How we interact with the farmer, how we um, um, interact with our land, our farmland, how does it food production interact with other beings? It's such an important subject. So um, in the coming years, uh, we will focus more on food literacy, which is part of um, the Kaduri Earth program, which we will continue to use food as a subject for us to inquire through how we eat, how, what we eat, why we care, and use this process to help people um, to inquire and our relationship with each other and the environment, so as to sustain our action for sustainable loving. And one of the concrete projects under this, um, this development is that we are working on a food hub project, which is in collaboration with the University of Hong Kong. And the food hub will happen um, in the Kaduri Center, which is next to the Kaduri farm. And this center was first set up in the 1980s. Um, with the nation, with the Kaduri family, and the very beginning um, focus on agricultural research. And under the Food Hub project, we are going to revitalize the canteen building as the base for the Food Hub for us to run a range of different programs to bring together people who are working on food education, sustainable food production, come together um, to build a synergy um, further. And at the same time, the Kaduri Center used to be a very important grant for a lot of important projects. Hong Kong U um, have been using it to host a lot of different events, same as Kaduri Farm. We have so many important events happened at the site before. For example, the first community support agriculture conference, um, and also the first um, Southeast um, Asia permaculture culture conference. All of these things happened at the Kaduri Center. And we believe that by bringing in the food as the focus, it's going to enrich the program and it's also going to help people to connect global action into local action and more importantly, to the very, very local action, I mean, the individual action as well. So um, we are hoping that the food hub will, um, will come to service um, in the middle of next year. Um, and um, at that time, maybe you can, you are all invited to visit us um, at the new facility. So now uh, I would like to pass the time back to Wanda to um, moderate the Q&A session.
Thank you very much, Heidi, and before uh, Gary and, and Joe. Uh, I think I'm always surprised myself how much different work we do, and actually the, the enormous variety of work we do. I think that's what we call holistic work, and uh, to see how all the different elements come together. I've got a few questions coming in. Uh, very encouraging to see, actually, that almost everybody stayed from the beginning to the end. It's already past five, so if, you, if you're listening in from work, thank you very much for staying. Um, and I've got a few questions here, actually, for all of them. So maybe I can start with ID, because there's a question here. You talked earlier about mainstreaming sustainable living. It's, it's, I'm not sure that's jargon or not, but can you explain a bit what it means in practice and, and what, how we've done that at, at uh, the Green Hub at Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden? Uh, thanks, Wanda. Um, actually, for us, um, when people talk about um, sustainable living or green living, most people sort of have a stereotype on our uh, well, it is kind of really tough um, lifestyle, or we have to um, go back to the past. But in fact, what we mean by mainstreaming um, sustainable living is more on um, a way of gaining um, more participation or finding it out how it is and actually um, sort of connecting it with other priority or other things that we are very uh, concerned about, which is actually a very important part of sustainable living. For example, the well-being of people. If you are eating well, then it contributes to your health. And if you are eating well, it contributes to the environment. If you're eating well, you contribute to the farmer. So actually by building all this connection, we are mainstreaming it. Um, it is not just about you, it's not just about food. So this is the theory when we are talking about mainstreaming and also about how we work thing. Um, for Kaduri Farm, I think we are increasingly working on partnership because we believe that um, by working with partnership with different um, people or organization and help us to reach out people with different um, um, with a different community, um, a wider group of audience. And also it helps us to learn um, the priority and how we can find the common ground of working together. So what we are talking about mainstreaming is building this connection, uh, putting the dots together so that it bring about a wider and more bigger impact. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so to spread so back to the food hub, um, it is um, sort of like creating under that thinking because we think we need to have more this kind of opportunity for us to synergize um, our way of doing things. Right. Josephine, I mean, can, can you also a bit elaborate, uh, I think you're ready to elaborate how that works for, uh, for, for, for holistic education? How can holistic education support, I would say, the mainstreaming of sustainable living? Yeah, actually, I think in um, the holistic education, first of all, we really hope that uh, it's something um, that is supplementing the um, mainstream education system. And because of the interconnectedness of the things and like nature and also like the values, they compassionate to the mother nature, to ourselves. And also to build an inner resilience and also like what ID has shared just now. I think this all relates to the values of uh, humanity. And this is like where we, you know, stand. And this is quite important that uh, we, we hope that um, the world will can also be um, real from the ecological standpoint rather than just from the economic standpoint because the since the industrial revolution so, so the 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 whole um uh, i think the world is built around reductionist uh, or linear system and also it's very very hard for us to continue um to think that this is going to solve all the solutions with us um, especially like Hong Kong is very imminent in the last few weeks, especially we have, uh, you know, having lots of typhoons and also heavy rain is, is a time for us to rethink how we actually learn to coexist with the mother nature. And I, I saw one um, question talking about, you know, like the visitors 
So I want to share, um, we see a lot of requests from uh, schools bringing their teachers. Um, usually it's like on their um, development day, professional development day, the whole school actually bring teachers uh, to us or you know half day or one day and this is something we think is um happening in, in the right way because uh teachers are under a lot of stress during the COVID but then when they started uh, going back into um the normal routine of life there seemed a lot of um um situations that they they find out from the students uh, that they need to actually bring nature back into their um their their normal life and and also um they also want to encourage the students to learn more about uh the 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 holy in a holistic manner not just uh, using their brain and also a lot of uh, delayed developments were seen especially for younger children so we see quite a lot of those requests uh, are coming in and also lots more visitations are from the schools uh, um, as well. So just to, you know, add on to that. Thank you, Joan. I, I get now a very different question. So we talk a lot about sustainable living and about mainstreaming. Gary, a very, I would say, more mundane question for you. Have there been any unusual animal visitors having blown in? I guess we mostly talk about um, about birds blown in in a recent storm. It's actually, do we have an, 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 an idea about the impact of the rain and the typhoons, the recent typhoons on, on, the, on the wildlife at Kadori Farm? Yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting that when we get typhoons, uh, quite often the week after the typhoon, we will start to receive um, species like seabirds, which we very rarely get uh, during the year, but birds like petrels. And um, even recently, we received a, a mammal, a bat, which is not, a, a, or as far as we understand, it's not a Hong Kong species, but again, it was after a storm. And bats, like many birds, are migratory. So um, so yeah, we do we do actually receive unusual uh, species uh, just after storms. Um, during wet weather, some some young animals do get into difficulties um, if they're not being protected well or if they've fallen out of the, the for birds if they've fallen out of the nest, so they get waterlogged. And I guess we see a few cases like that from sort of extreme. Uh, a rainy weather so yeah it does actually i don't i don't have any kind of specific statistics about this but it's very notable that um after extreme weather events uh where we we get surprises we get animals turning up that we haven't seen all year so yes another another interesting one but maybe i'll, I'll answer that one later myself let me first go to Thanks, Gary. Yeah, because what we want to do actually is to going forward is to, we do a lot of scientific research at Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden. We have um, at least 30 people working on different projects and surveys. And since we ex exist for so many decades already, we can see look at only what's happening over time. You know, we can see what's happening, how we were, how many populations we had, and we've seen um, uh, with the reforestation programs we had in our habitat restoration. That we increased biodiversity tremendously over the past uh, decades here. Now, actually, we're getting increasing concern about the impact of climate change. So, so when we have a storm in a rain, in a big rainstorm here, our streams and our uh, pools are full, are getting so violent for the animals who live there that it may have a negative impact on the inhabitants of our stream. So we're going to measure that to see actively what impacts this volatile climate uh, events have on, on, nature, on nature conservation and biodiversity. So we're going to further look into that in the, going, in the future. Going back to agriculture, because agriculture, of course, is how we started at Ascadori Agriculture Aid Association, the KAA, in, in uh, almost 70 years ago. Now, 
is, is, is local agriculture ID? Would local agriculture produce be a focus of the ongoing food program? How, how is the local agriculture, the Hong Kong agriculture being part actually of your food program, if at all? Yes, yeah, certainly um, local agriculture will be um, a very uh, fundamental part of our food program um, because we believe local agriculture is uh, actually um, something that we can bring people to have a direct connection with what's surrounding us and also um, an area that we can actually add locally. So um, it would certainly be our subject and also uh, certainly be the focus. And also um, by observing the local agriculture, um, we can also see how we interact in a way like following the season, um, how the society can serve in a way to support um, better way of agriculture. So that will remain a very important component of the future food program. But more importantly, I would also like to say that um, we also want to have um, people experience um, to be a food producer as well. That's why we work a lot on reskilling. Um, we believe that everyone has the ability to grow some of our own food. And if this idea is mainstream in a certain way, um, people will find their opportunity to explore it further. So um, I think this is something very important when we are talking about like for a city like Hong Kong, how we can um, react to food supply and also food production um, challenges in the coming years. I love the uh, phrase, everybody can produce some own food, maybe not sufficiently to survive, you're not even Hong Kong with a small space, but yes, everybody can grow food. And I think it's a very important part to be close to nature. So keep that one in mind. Now, linking to that, thinking that we were an, a farm and we st still many people talk about Kadori Farm, Botanic Gardens, the farm. But of course, farming is just a minor part of it. it it's more of a showcasing what we do than a production farm. I got a question here from Dorothy Lam saying, do you, and that's the Josephine, I can move over to you in a minute before I answer. Can you, do you consider to turn in Kadori Farm or Tenigar into a Kadori for, Forest University, the first forest, forest university in Hong Kong? My initial answer would be, well, actually we're using our forest a lot for our education program. So it is a, definitely a school already, but maybe Josephine, you are highly educated than me. So what actually is, a forest university. Can you give an answer? Can you give some ideas on that? Yeah, I I would think that we we are we are, we are already, <laughs> but we just don't use that name because, um, like what um, Gary has uh, shared, it's a lot of uh, native biodiversity you can find here at the farm, and we actually no want to nurture curiosity. So. More people, if they come here, then they would actually use um, the resources in the right way to learn about the, the biodiversity here and also about the ways how we actually nurture the soil and also the food. Um, but this is a very good suggestion. And I would say maybe we could explore the ideas as a community to to discuss and also to 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 throw around for people who have like mind who are like minded to see how that could actually be nurtured as an is an idea. So yeah, thanks uh, Dorothy for the question. But um, yeah, I think we 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 can think a little bit more into this uh, this direction as well. I've got a few more questions coming in. So if you have a question, please uh, ask your, I would say your final one before we close off here. Uh, but I can choose a few, for, I only can choose a few from that. Gary, one for you. Um, you talked in a few things about scientific programs and so far in our conversation, we mostly talk about sustainable living, holistic education, uh, a lot about agriculture, but also science is an important pillar of what we do here. So how can science actually help in mainstreaming sustainable living it almost likes a contradiction in terminus how can science help us to to harmonize with the environment and to make sure that we are more resilient in climate against climate change well i think the preservation of biodiversity is a a key key role that we all we all have at kuri farm and um actually um 
keep we're, we're sort of through the rescue work we're putting animals back into the wild sometimes we come across very rare species that uh, the populations are small and so by putting a, an animal back obviously you're you're helping a population it might be a population of turtles or a bird um, so I think this that kind of links to sort of a sustainable system a nature system so um, I think uh, yeah so our so our work um, various projects are are trying to preserve um, our natural history and our biodiversity and those those sort of work into uh, a sort of sustainable natural system. So um, I think there are many things that we're doing with the golden coin turtle, for instance, a, a species which is close to extinction. We don't want to lose it. And for many of these species, we don't actually know how wide and how important their role is actually in ecology. So better we leave them in rather than take them out. And if they are getting rare, we should um, try to preserve them uh, so that their, their numbers don't completely uh, disappear. So, so I think there are many aspects of our work that are kind of feeding in to a more so, sort of a sustainable uh, ecosystem. Actually, I want to, you know, also maybe add on to uh, Gary's uh, um, sharing. Uh, Actually, in the holistic science manner, we we don't actually see them as uh, separated. So I mean, the animals, the plants, um, the the human being, we all think that is part of nature, and we 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 should actually think is one whole. You know, there's a wholeness in how we interact and how we rely on each other. So um, partly under the Kaduri Earth program, we are trying to actually uh, increase uh, some of these um, uh, kind of thinking uh, through different kinds of programs or through, um, you know, in the next year's talk, we might actually, you know, in, in also uh, bring in Engage Ecology, which talks about the different layers of ecology and, when we are talking about the ecology, it's also not just about um, the scientific side of it. So uh, the, these are the the, the interrelatedness, uh, and also the um, the farm is at a very um, good advantage to bring forth uh, all these um, experiences and also how to uh, learn them on our site. So these are the things maybe um, the audience can also look up more later on. Yeah, if I can, if I can continue as well. Actually, our flora department, um, just their work on the interaction between insects and pollinating, uh, like orchids, is really really important because actually some of these factors that are carrying out the pollination they're just unknown, and so um, there's always the danger that you might destroy one part of the chain without realizing how important they are um, in uh, you know, keeping alive a whole uh, system. So I think pollination is a very, very important area. And several departments actually at Kaduri Farm, they, they touch on pollination. It may be um, about bats and pollen, bats role in pollination and seed dispersal, and then through the flora conservation department, investigating which insect is involved in maintaining a population of um, orchids. Uh, so, so I think there's a scientific angle um, to some of the work um, and there's a lot of education involved. So, uh, you, you know, there's a crossover here where it's uh, things like pollination are so critical, uh, not just for the ecosystem, but for humans as well. So. Uh, we we tend to touch or cross over uh, between education, fauna, flora, uh, through research and through observation and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, we, um, we have we have two more wait, wait, we have two more minutes. I'd like to each to stay, please, because I've got a few two very important slides. Heidi, one last uh, word from you, and then please, people, we still have you mostly on board because the last two slides are the most important ones. So please stay five more minutes, <laughs> Heidi. Yeah, I just want to add um, to, to the previous discussion, which is um, 
sustainable living, um, habitat management, agricultural practice, biodiversity conservation, they are not separate things. And the science um, is actually how um, helping that um, as to see all these things are actually interrelated. And in fact, like sustainable way of agriculture is actually being used as a habitat management practice for preserving biodiversity in many cases in Hong Kong and also even at KFB, KFBG, it is um, part of their holistic asset management intervention. So um, I just like to compliment that these things come together. Excellent. Thank you, Aileen. These are great last words from your side. Um, two more slides, as I said, because quite a few people ask us, how can we how can we support Kadori Farm Botanic Garden? And of course, you can always donate money, but that's the easy part. I would say let's make it a bit more challenging. And we always like to have visitors here because most of you have been here before, but if not, this is truly one of the most beautiful parts of the region of Hong Kong. And on December 2 and 3, we have the Heikatonic Treasure Hunt at Kadori Farm Botanic Garden. You see here a picture of last year when it was beautiful, but we still had COVID, so lots of people wearing face masks. This is the first time we have actually, this is the first nature hackathon. That'll be the first face mask free, at least you're not allowed, you're not uh, obliged to, to walk and uh, look at treasures in Kadori Farm or Tony Garden. We expect about a thousand people participating. It will be a great day, including music from Dr. Gary Aids, including ice cream, including free beer, but especially to enjoy nature. So sign up please for our nature hackathon and treasure hunts. You can sign up as a team, as your family, as your corporate in, uh, group, but just it's a great team building exercise and you would support us, you would support nature and you would support the environment of Hong Kong in the fight against climate change. So please come over. It's uh, You still have two months to sign up and we hope to also see you here. So thank you very much for joining us today. I mean, you've been all great for the last uh, 90 minutes being patient and staying with us. So thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you got a little bit inspired. If you want to read more details, you can download our annual report in the link. It's all free. And please come over and hope to see you next time. Thank you and uh, have a great evening. Bye bye.